I'm going to give you five game-changing distinctions, and any one of them on its own might be the exact master key that works for your particular lock, but combining them all is where the real power is. I'm going to do something else that you rarely see in this kind of a self-helpy conversation, and it's the one thing that you rarely get with this kind of advice, but that can make the crucial difference in getting you the results that you want. I'm actually going to offer you proof that it works. In fact, we're going to start with the proof. Everything that I'm sharing in this video, I learned from this guy, my friend Sean Stevenson. He was the most confident person I ever met, period, full stop. And as I shuffle through a couple of pictures of him, one of the things that you might notice is that he had some pretty persuasive reasons to be insecure. Short, two and a half feet tall. Bald, most of it gone by his early 30s. Teeth, lost most of them too. He suffered from a rare disorder called osteogenesis imperfecta, more commonly known as brittle bone syndrome. And the continuous breaking of his bones a few dozen just in childbirth, left him deformed, unable to perform any basic tasks without help, and uh, in substantial pain. I once asked him if, after breaking bones, literally hundreds of times, if it was less painful for him than for somebody with normal bones. And he looked at me with a level stare that chilled my blood when he answered, brother, you never get used to breaking a femur. He was a smart guy, but far from the smartest in our social circle. He wasn't anything close to rich, though many people assumed that he was because of his big public presence. And yet, this man really did live like a rock star. And I'm not kidding when I say, and I'll say it again, he's the most confident man that I've ever known. He had so much confidence, in fact, that he had enough to share. See, he believed in you. He was more confident on your behalf than you believed in yourself. He loved you. It didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter how fucked up. He just loved you. And you could feel the truth of his simple love for you and what you were going through in your life. And he was relentlessly positive. Relentless. He could always inject the positive reframe into any situation. He could sit with you in compassion in the depth of tragedy and always find the positive spin, even when he was the one that was suffering. And that's not because he was just naturally positive or because he was superhuman, but because he was just completely committed to it. Like a Navy SEAL is committed to the mission. He would do whatever it took. He'd die if necessary to find that positive in any situation. And as a result, you just felt more alive when Sean was in the room. And nobody could describe Sean without mentioning his sense of humor. He wasn't just funny, he had a gift. He could do the clown for the kids, he could crush anyone with the perfect burn, he could take down a room with the perfect lightning fast one liner, and he could be absolutely filthy. One of his protégés recently said to me, that he was the perfect blend of Jesus plus Austin Powers. And it would be tempting to believe that in some kind of cosmic balance of fairness, Sean got his humor, his positivity, and his confidence in exchange for the broken body he'd be given. But that is not the case. What made Sean the most powerful and brilliant man on earth when it came to ridding a person of the insecurities that plagued them for their entire lives wasn't his optimism, it was his truth. He didn't pretend that he never got emotionally hurt. He didn't pretend that he wasn't afraid when he was scared. He owned it. He cried. He had some really, really bad days. He was authentic in his radical vulnerability. He was no god. He was achingly human. Here are the crucial lessons that Sean taught me and so many others that shattered their deepest insecurities and healed them. One, your message is hidden in your mess. Sean was an unbelievable public speaker, and he taught a class on public speaking, and one of the things he used to say to his students was, 
your message is in your mess, meaning the aspects of your own story that were the most messy, the things that you were most ashamed of, the things that tripped you up, the things that were uncomfortable, frankly, for you to talk about, the things that caused you the most problems, this was the good stuff. This was the stuff that made you you. It was the stuff that was the most compelling in your story, and your particular mess, if exposed, if turned into the message of who you are, why you're here, is not only powerful, it's the single best connection that you have with others. The things that you're afraid to reveal about yourself, ironically, turn out to be the very things that will make people like you, that will make people respect you, that will make people trust you, and will make people see themselves in you and feel close to you. Two, what's funny about this? Now, it's hard to believe if you knew him, but Sean wasn't necessarily born funny. He worked on funny. He loved comedy, and he watched a lot of it. And you should, too. Comedy, especially the most tasteless and unpolitically correct comedy, which was the kind that Sean liked the most, teaches you how to find the humor in dark things. It teaches you the truth about what it is to be a human, which is that laughing about it or crying about it, that's a choice. And if you pay attention, it'll teach you how to be a lot funnier, too. Sean told me that he learned to be funny by asking himself in every moment, what's funny about this? What might be funny about this? And pretty soon, your brain gets good at it, and its highest value, then, once your brain gets good at it, is when shit goes horribly wrong. In the depths of the hard times, you learn to ask yourself, what's funny about this? And being able to laugh with yourself, learning to not take it all so damn seriously, learning that this horrible and hysterical reality is the truth of what it means to be a human, is a giant leap in your ability to be confident in any situation. Three, get back up. Recognize that everyone gets knocked down. Everyone. In fact, the most accomplished people in the world are nearly always the ones that got knocked down the most. But they're also the ones that consistently got back up the most. There is no shame in getting knocked down. Everyone gets knocked down. Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, said, if you don't want to ever be wrong, then it's wise to never have a creative idea about anything. Failure is part of the game of winning. And as Sean often quoted, pain is inevitable. Suffering is always a choice. Getting back up is a lot harder than laying there and bleeding, feeling sorry for yourself. But every time you do it, every time you get back up, you get stronger. Getting back up is never the obvious thing. It's never the only thing. It's a choice. It's usually the hard choice. And it's the choice that everyone you admire found the courage to make over and over again in their lives. Four, love people. For a lot of people who suffer with insecurities, this is a really difficult reframe because they're so busy feeling jealousy and resentment and competition with other people that it's hard to just drop that stuff and accept people. Sean just loved people for exactly who they were, the good, the bad, the downright difficult, because he knew the big secret. Nobody's better than anyone else. We're all stuck in our own challenges. We're all doing the best we can with the hand we've been dealt and the information we have, making the choice to just love people and to really authentically try to understand them, to help them, is it's a pathway out of your own head. Insecurities are unhelpful, usually irrational thought loops. They play the same song over and over again, and that song is about you. Stop being so preoccupied with you and instead focus on really trying to help other people, love other people, find compassion, understanding for their challenges, help them with their challenges. Not everyone can pump so much love and compassion into other people that they can heal them instantly of their pain the way that Sean could, okay? He was special. I used to call that his Jesus powers. But you can try. And that effort will yield powerful friendships, deep human bonds, a sense of belonging. And it's not just like that it erases your insecurities. It's just that 
Your insecurities are simply left out. They're not part of this new game. They're back in your old way of doing things, your old way of viewing the world. In the love people game, your insecurities just don't come up. And then, suddenly, you read loud and clear to yourself and to others as a person who seems to have no insecurities. Five, it didn't happen to you, it happened for you. So when Sean was a little kid, his favorite day of the year was Halloween, and his parents would make him a costume, usually that included his wheelchair, so that, for example, he'd be a pirate and the chair would be made into a big cardboard pirate ship. And it was the one day of the year that he could go outside and go trick-or-treating with the other kids, and nobody would know about his condition. He would just fit in like anybody else. Anybody that didn't know him would have no way of knowing that he was disabled. He was just, you know, a cute little boy in a very cool costume. So one day when Sean was in fourth grade, as his dad was putting the finishes and touches on the chair and he was rolling around on the floor, <clears throat> the door to the bedroom swung shut and it, it snapped his femur. And in one blinding instant of physical agony, Sean realized that Halloween was canceled this year and that he'd be back in the hospital, another surgery, more pins and casts. And he cried out, why me? Why does God hate me? And Gloria, his mother, who was a devout Catholic, fell onto her knees beside him. And she said, Sean, you're going to have to decide right now if this condition is going to be a burden or a blessing. And on that day, that little boy, who was taught to believe that God is good, made an unbelievably courageous decision. That his condition didn't happen to him but that it happened for him. And he lived by those words every day of his life afterwards. I once asked him, I said, if God came down, he said, you could do it all over again, but without the condition, what would you do? And he said he would choose the wheelchair again. He knew, after working with hundreds of patients, that every one of us has their own cross. He had his, I have mine, you have yours. But he also knew that the inescapable truth of his condition made it impossible to hide it. He couldn't just, you know, sit in shame in a closet. Everyone knew, and he knew that because of this, he had special gifts, special access to say shit that other people just couldn't get away with. It gave him those Christ-like powers to heal people of their grief, of their pain, of their insecurities, sometimes in a single moment. And he wouldn't have traded that, not for legs, not for anything. And I believed him. So, unlike Sean, your stuff is easily hidden, it's easily lied about, it's easily kept in the shameful shadows, and so nobody's ever said to you that you had to make the choice. Is your challenge, whether it's social, romantic, existential, emotional, is your challenge going to be your burden or your blessing? Can you take on this idea that your challenge didn't happen to you, but that it happened for you? Just like that fourth grader with a broken leg, the choice really is yours. Now, will this work for you? Well, Sean's the proof. His life is the proof. He had it harder than you. He had it harder than me. But he was the most confident man I've ever met. He was one of the happiest men I've ever met. He helped thousands and thousands of other people with his message. He lived his passion. He had a huge circle of friends that just adored him. And he had a, a beautiful, huge-hearted wife who adored him. He had love. He had laughter all around him. And so can you. So, Sean died in an accident a few weeks ago. His wheelchair tipped off a ramp, and uh, he hit his head. And on his way into surgery, he held his wife Mindy's hand in one hand, and one of his best friends, Joe Polish, who was there, he held his hand in his other hand, and he said to them, in a moment of lucidity, right before they wheeled him in, this didn't happen to me. It happened for me. And so he, he died with the same courage that he lived with. 
There are people that believe that the universe itself is God, that God includes all of manifestation, that everything, including you and me, are just fractals, little pieces of the whole of everything, and that when we die, we just become less discreet and more inclusive fractals of God. And I believe that Sean is with you and I right now, as you watch me, like Yoda, <laughs> watching over us. And what I laid out in this video isn't easy. It's not the easy way to live your life. I'm asking you, I believe Sean is asking you to do the hard. You will get no second chances at this life. And every minute that remains is a minute in which you can make the decision to do these things that will create the change you want. And as Sean said, it doesn't take legs to stand. It takes heart 